want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, today's talk is uh, from Chris Rakakis. Uh, Chris uh, fairly recently got his PhD in applied mathematics from UC Irvine, and he's currently um, an instructor in the math department at MIT. And the thing that confused me, he also works at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy because he's interested in pharmacokinetics. And when I was in Maryland over the summer, I had the hardest time connecting with him, even though I thought he wasn't that far away in Maryland. So I don't believe that second. Uh, <laughs> I have one slide at the end in the pharmacometrics, right? <laughs> so, uh, so he'll be talking about Julia and related things. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, what, I, what I want to kind of go through with this is this new paper that we put out on universal differential equations for scientific machine learning. And the, the hypothesis or the basis behind all of it is that you know, the one takeaway is that the major advances in machine learning were really due to encoding more structure into the model. Right? And so what we want to do is, we, what, what we really want to do is we want to look at problems where we don't have the correct structure from before and kind of analyze it and say, how do we add real structure that we know about to the models that we're doing to be able to improve the learning? Right? And what we want to start with is basically say, this, this idea of adding structure isn't new. Right? Uh, this actually comes from ideas like convolutional neural networks. Right? Where what a convolutional neural network did was it said, well, you know, you could think about a picture as just a vector of numbers, but a picture is not a vector of numbers, right? If you are to the left or to the, if you're the pixel to the left or to the right or to above or below, those are more similar to the pixel in the middle than a pixel way over on the other end, right? So why would you use a neural network that treats all of your numbers the same? You should be doing something like taking squares and then saying like, oh, maybe the average of this square is some quantity of interest, right? And so that's exactly what a convolutional neural network is doing. That's the convolutional convolution uh, operation, right? It's, it's just the structure of the of picture or structure of spatial information is what was added to the convolutional neural network and suddenly say, oh, you know, now image processing is solved by deep learning, right? So really, it wasn't just a step to say, you know, deep learning didn't solve it on its own. We added the information of how pictures work, how spatial information works, and then it was solved, right? So maybe we should be doing something like that to be able to make machine learning work better within scientific disciplines, right? And so then the, the leading question there is, what is the structure of science, right? So if we want to embed the structure of science into our deep learning framework so that way it works better, we need to figure out what that structure is. And really what it comes down to is uh, differential equations. So if you haven't seen differential equations in a long time, um, this is a very good introduction because it has emojis, so therefore it's not scary, right? <laughs> so, uh, so D rabbit DT equals alpha rabbit minus beta rabbit wolf, you know, D wolf DT. Is, you know, so these are just equations that say the amount of rabbits over time changes like this, the amount of wolves over time changes like this. Now the interesting thing about these differential equations is that they're highly structural, right? They're highly mechanistic. What we're basically saying is that uh, rabbits have exponential growth. That's what this term means. And then that rabbits die when they get eaten by wolves. This is what this term means, right? In the next term you say, well, if you have more wolves, then the amount that wolves changes, it must decrease, right? Because if you have more wolves, you're competing over the same food. And so therefore, this term has a meaning. Also, if you have more rabbits, then you also will increase the amount of, of, you'll increase the amount of wolves that you get because you'll have more food. And so it turns out that if you say, this is how things interact in nature, you put some parameters in there, what comes out of it is a solution that is cyclic, where you have the number of rabbits goes up and down, number of wolves goes up and down, and they kind of track each other in, in this way. I never said that they're cyclic though, right? I just said, these are how things interact, and now this is what comes out of it. And so this is the interesting thing, thing that happens with differential equations, right? You just kind of have some mechanisms, and from these mechanisms, you get, very, you get behavior that comes out that you have to try to analyze and understand. And these structures get really deep, right? So if you actually look at what's going on right now in systems biology, you don't just, you know, there's not just observations going on and someone drawing a picture. There's a lot of math in the background, right? So when people are saying, like, oh, my RA turns into RAN, and then it binds with this binding protein, et cetera, et cetera, right? Well, you actually get out of these kinds of systems are these chemical reaction networks where what we have as our underlying information is this differential equation, right? So this differential equation tells us about the structure of how RAR and B is upregulating the change in the amount of RAN, right? And so if you actually look at these system biology literature, you know, you don't necessarily, you don't, won't find data, right? You won't find homogeneous data that is like 100 million points saying that this thing is true. 
right? What you'll find is you'll find a hundred different scattered experiments that independently verify each, you know, one little arrow at this at a time, and then this is the structure that we end up knowing. And so if you want to ask what our data is in a scientific lab, right, our data is actually this model right here, right? This is our aggregate of all of the data that we had before, and this is what we need to train from, right? So what we're doing with scientific machine learning or scientific AI is we're integrating these domain models with machine learning. Right? We're basically saying what we have are these scientific structures and forms of differential equations or simulators, things that we know are mostly correct. And what we need to do is we need to use these mostly correct models to be able to augment the small amount of data that we have. Right? Because maybe, maybe each data point that we need, we need to grow another mouse. And it might take, you know, we might only have 100 mice. We can't just get 100 million mice just because Sierra Neural Network needs that as our training data. Right? So we need to use all of the past experiments from before, even though we can't see their data set, we just know the structure of what the results were like. We need to use that information in our machine learning somehow. And so what we're really trying to do then is we're trying to understand what is the difference between what is going on in the scientific structures and the current structures of machine learning, and how do we pair these two together? And really the, the, the core behind the difference is this mechanistic modeling versus non-mechanistic modeling, right? You basically, both of them are trying to find a, a mathematical model, but a mathematical model is just a function, right? So if I had the number of rabbits today, I put it into the model, it's just a function or a program which spits out the number of rabbits tomorrow, right? But there are two different ways we can really do this, right? So the, the scientific way is the differential equation where you describe a few mechanisms or structures, and then you get the, this aggregate behavior if your mechanisms and structures are correct, right? You're, so you're basically just saying like, oh, there's something like, you know, there's a term in there which says that the rate at which rabbits, the amount of rabbits is changing is proportional to the current amount of rabbits, and that just gives you uh, exponential growth. And so what you have to do is you do a small scientific experiment that says if I change the amount of rabbits, how does the growth of rabbits change? And then you can verify these terms individually, right? So science naturally gives you these differential equations because you're doing these small little perturbation experiments, which tell you how things are changing, and uh, how the changes are interrelated, right? So you naturally kind of have these things, but machine learning is doing something completely different, right? Because it's saying, here I'm gonna specify model as a learnable black box, like neural network, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna learn what function goes there by just giving it a bunch of input-output data sets, right? So I'm gonna say the number of rabbits today is this, the number of rabbits tomorrow is that, and I'm gonna keep on giving it training data pairs, and I'm gonna find, you know, I'm gonna change the parameters of my neural network so that way this model actually does this input-to-output behavior correctly. And so your question might be, well, which of these two is better, right? So, you know, if you're, the undergraduate student wants to learn what is the only, what is the only math I need to learn? What is the one math class I need to learn, right? Is it this one or is it this one, right? And the answer is, if you look at it like this, the answer is clear that it's neither, right? They both have pros and cons, right? So the, the mechanistic models are great because they understand structure, right? We, we put in there things that we know about nature, things that we know about, you know, these scientific laws are what form these differential equations. And they can extrapolate far beyond the data because you know if you have the right mechanisms, then you say, well, what happens when I go to these new parameters? You can make very accurate guesses. Like Newtonian physics is one of the great examples of that, where you say, well, you know, even though it isn't completely correct when you go to the galactic scale, you got pretty dang close just by understanding this inverse, you know, inverse square law. And it's interpretable, right? Because if you look at any of those parameters, the parameters in the Lock Volterra equation are things like what is the growth rate of rabbits, and you say, say, well, what if I give rabbits, you know, what if I make rabbits more horny? And then you just say, well, that's the same thing as increasing alpha in this equation, right? So your parameters all have meaning, and you can understand, you can simulate what will happen in different scenarios by changing around your parameters because they're all interpretable, right? So mechanistic models are great, but they are very limiting because the first thing that you need for a mechanistic model is you need to know the mechanism. And you know, what is the mechanism for how, um, I don't know, well, what's the mechanism for how the how the, the movies that you've watched in the past is going to change what movie you're going to watch in the future, right? The, the recommendation problem in Netflix. Where do you even start with building a differential equation for that, right? If you don't know anything about mechanism, you just can't do mechanistic models. And so the word non-mechanistic models are great is that if you don't have any model to start from, but if you just have a bunch of data, you can generate the model itself from the data. 
And so these are two very different things, right? So one of them, you can come with a lot of prior structural knowledge and with very little data, you can extrapolate well, you can have all these nice properties, but you need to know a lot about the structure of your problem in order for this to work. And on the other hand, here's something that requires you can just walk into there with just data and have a working model in time as long as you've had enough data. So neither of them are better, they just do different things. And so maybe what we need to be doing is instead of trying to say, well, maybe, you know, should, should people be taking the, the, the science differential equation course or should they be doing machine learning? Well, maybe what needs to happen is we need to start doing them both in tandem so that way we can use the pros of both of them while mitigating each of their cons, right? And so let's start to mix the scientific structure with machine learning. And so, you know, that's, that's clear from this point that we should do that, but how exactly do we do it, right? And so what we're really going to take from machine learning is the universal approximation theorem. So the universal approximation theorem is really just this idea that a neural network can get epsilon close to any arbitrary function, right? So when I say, you know, there is model that is this transformation from input to output, the, the universal approximation theorem is essentially says that if you're, if that, if what is generating your process in the background, if it really is something that is nice enough, then a large enough neural network will have enough parameters such that it can be that, uh, that function, right? So you can find parameters of your neural network such that it can basically match any possible function. And so one thing that, the one way to look at what machine learning has given us is not something that matches data, but it's something that can, that, that can basically parameter as functions that you don't know about, right? It's essentially a fancy Taylor series that is good for computing, right? It's terrible for analysis, it's really hard to analyze, but essentially it's a, it's a function approximator thing where you put the right parameters in there and now it's, a, that, it's that function that you didn't know, right? And so what are some ways to be able to describe it? Well, neural numbers are just a form of nonlinear function approximation, right? There's a lot of other function approximators you can use. You could, for example, use a polynomial. Polynomials have some good properties. Like what is A3? Well, you know what A3 is because, you know, Taylor's, Taylor's theorem tells you is the second root, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, you, uh, so polynomials are one function approximator you can choose, or you can have, if you know something about your function, you can choose a very specific nonlinear form and be able to fit it well. But if you have absolutely no idea what your function is, it turns out that a neural network, which is this thing where you, you, know, you do a matrix multiply, you add a vector, you do something nonlinear to it, matrix multiply, a vector, matrix, you, know, you do this a few times, right? The number of times you do it, it just gets deeper and deeper. We do that a few times, and it's able to approximate any possible function that is on the other side here. So if you want to approximate e to the x, well, you could do that by this kind of structure where you choose the right weights, and now you put x in, what comes out will match out e to the x. You can do that to any possible function, and that's why a neural network is useful. So mathematicians in the room, yes, you can use Fourier series, uh, you know, Chevy Chef series, all these other things. And so why were neural networks the one that got popular, right? That's a good question, because literally, they're all just different ways to do function approximation. And really what happens is that neural networks are universal approximators, so they can approximate any function, and, but they're universal approximators that work well in high dimensions. So if you have a very high dimensional problem, they, do, they overcome the curse of dimensionality, that's what they say. So it just means that um, the amount of computation or the amount of parameters that you need to be able to make a neural network work in high dimensions grows polynomially instead of exponentially. A lot of the other things that we looked at, for example, like Chebyshev series, the key, the, one of the ways to be able to say, hey, I want to make a multi-dimensional Chebyshev series, you can take tensor products of spaces, and it turns out that if you have a term that doesn't fit perfectly on your basis, you can need exponentially number terms in high dimensional spaces to be able to actually approximate that function. Turns out neural networks don't have these isotropy issues, all these classical issues in numerical analysis, and you can then say, you know, if I have a hundred dimensional function, one of the best ways to be able to parameterize it is through this neural network, right? So it really just is a way to be able to turn a function that you don't know about into a problem of finding a finite list of parameters that then gives you what the missing function is. And that's the property from machine learning that we're going to use, right? It's, it's, it's the non-mechanistic property, this property of being able to hold on to something that we didn't know that is a function in, the, in, a, very, in a way that is easy to compute and easy to optimize. That's what we're going to grab from machine learning to add to these scientific structures. And now the, the difficulty with neural networks is that learn, you know, neural networks can do everything, right? So they can learn from scratch from any data set. And so the pro of a neural network is that if you have a very high dimensional problem, it can learn to be, no matter what function was there, it can learn to be it. 
And so the con of a neural network is that it can literally do everything, and so therefore it doesn't do anything particularly well, right? So, I mean, you can train it to be a linear function in high dimensional space if you give it enough data points, but you can know, try it yourself, like generate data to be on a line and find out how long it takes to be able to actually train that neural network to be able to be a perfect line, you know, in thousand dimensions. It's really terrible at being a line, and being a line is pretty easy, right? But that doesn't mean a neural network's good or bad, it just means that neural networks are the most flexible object in the you could probably think of, right? In some mathematical sense, they are the most flexible object, and so therefore they will require a lot of training data to flex it into the right spot, right? That's just, you know, in some intuitive sense, that makes sense, right? So this is why machine learning requires big data and lots of compute time, because we chose an object that can literally do everything and we said, well, let's just keep on punching at it enough until it does the one thing that we want. And so this is where we go, well, maybe the right way to go with neural networks then is to add some structure to it, right? If we force some structure to it, so that way it can only do things that are physical or only do things that are biologically realizable, then it might have a much better shot at learning something that is realistic. And so the structure of differential equations, or the structure of science, right, what we want to impose on it is differential equations and what we really have is a tool for learning functions. So let's put this tool for learning functions inside of differential equations. And this is where we get to things of the universal differential equation, right? So the, the simplest form of a universal differential equation is the neural ordinary differential equation. That's kind of our starting point. But what we say is u prime equals f, and let f be a neural network. So what does that mean, right? What it means is that now f is any possible function that is described by this finite list of parameters, right? It can literally be any possible function, and we can move these parameters around such that it will act like that possible function. And so what we can do then is we can say, well, what, what it's actually doing is it's trying to learn what the missing function on the right-hand side was that would give us the solution to the different, the correct time series. And you can see now, you know, we have this thing in Julia, which, you know, within 30 seconds, it gives you a solution, or it's able to train these neural difference equations, be able to, you know, find out like, oh, right now this is my prediction, given my current, uh, given my current ODE, and then what it will do is it will keep on changing the parameters that define the f of the ODE until it finds the right time series to be able to line up with the data, right? So this is something that's not learning to be a time series predictor. It's learning to be the, the function that defines the differential equation, and then when you solve that differential equation, it will give you the correct time series. Right? That, that difference might seem slight, but if you're someone who's in the room who has some like a numerical analysis background, then you might, so far, you might instantly see that that difference is very crucial, right? Because once you can hold on to the function f, you can do things like analyze its stability, look at its uh, phase spots, like all these things that you know from dynamical systems, you can now do to something that was unknown, right? Because you can now parameterize the unknown as a function. And so where we then go with uh, universal differential equations is you say, we have a tool to find missing functions, so what happens if you know part of the system, but you don't know the other part, right? So let's say the truth was this lock and pair equation that we looked at before. And now let's say all that you know about your system is that the number of rabbits grows exponentially, and the number of, of wolves, you know, since they have to compete with each other, that, they're going to die off exponentially, right? So you can say the, equation, the model that I know is the x prime equals alpha x and y prime equals minus delta y, right? That's what I know. But I know that if I only have those equations, I'm completely wrong, right? Because the number of rabbits doesn't go to infinity, <coughs> and so I'm missing something. And so what I say is I put a universal approximator here. It could be anything. It could be a neural network. It could be a random forest. You know, it could be anything that is able to approximate any possible function. And my question is, can I learn what function I'm missing here just by training neural networks against data? And so what we did was we, you know, we generated some data from the ground truth. We trained a neural network so that, so that way the u1 and the u2 actually learn to be the missing part of the function. And if you plot it, you can actually easily see that, you know, hey, this, this, what this neural network learns to be is it learns to be that missing quadratic function. And there's two different things that you can do on that. First of all, you can, you can then uh, do a sparse regression. <coughs> and so we actually have this last part as a new package where we, it, since it's a very simple function, you can do a sparse regression and ask it what function of this basis is it closest to. And then it'll actually spit out that this is actually a quadratic function. Right, so you can actually uh, build a package that now says, oh, that neural network is best approximated by this stick of law tech, and it'll give you out that law tech. Right, because it's not a very difficult neural, neural network, it's just approximating a quadratic. 
And the other thing is you can say, well, let's only train it on data from zero to three. You train it on that on that data set, and then you and then you solve the differential equations for the future. And then what you get is you get this line, and the true data points in the future are this are these square points. And you see that it's able to extrapolate beyond the training data set. But why is it able to do that? Well, because it learned a very simple function. The only thing missing here was a quadratic, right? And so this is this is something that, that you know. The other thing to really point out here is that this has turned the problem into something that is very simple. <coughs> to be able to learn to be the solution to the lock Volterra equations would be something that's very difficult, right? To actually try to predict the time series itself is very difficult because the integral of that ODE is something that's not even representable in terms of elementary functions. There are not functions that you can write down to do this. But instead, we've turned this into a problem of, I know some of the model, the only thing that's missing is a quadratic function, and you just stick a neural network on there and say, can you learn to be a quadratic function with 30 data points? And it goes, 30 data points? I don't even need 30 to be a quadratic function. You could have did that with three, right? So, yeah? So, yeah. what about like multiplicity of possible x, right? Yeah, well, so you do have to make sure that, you know, you, you don't have, yeah, yeah, you can have comp weird compensations going on, for example, you can be, like, so, yeah, no, 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 there's, there's some be other U1 and U2s which match the Yeah, there could be other U1s and U2s in certain circumstances. We don't know what exactly the circumstances are. That'd be a great thing to look at for numerical analysis. It turns out in this problem, if you start from pretty much any random parameterization, we've done this many times now, it always gives you something that is learning exactly the functions that we're missing. In what cases will that be true or what cases will it not be true? Well, I already know that you know if you have a U1 here and you also have another neural network, you won't necessarily have one of those be zero and the other one be correct, right? And so you don't necessarily know at this point what are the properties that are required so that you will get the correct system out, but we do know that you know in some cases you will get the correct system out. Yeah. You motivated by saying um, you know learning to be a straight line seems really really difficult, but it's really hard because functions can do anything, neural networks can do anything. Yeah. And then here you motivated all you all you have to learn is a quadratic, all you need, all you need is three points. So there seems to be a slight inconsistency there. What's the difference between your previous analogy and then here? Well, here here well, so okay. So here it is only learning to be a quadratic in a very constrained region, because if you actually look at the phase space plot, it's just going around in circles, right? So you're basically saying like, oh, most of phase space is actually covered even just by the training data. Um, but the other, the other thing that's going on is that this ends up being a very low dimensional problem, right? Um, so, it, so we basically said that, you know, the, the problem of learning to be everything, to be able to predict every single point in the time series is really the problem of, you know, you take the initial condition of two points in and you spit out a hundred points, right? This is really just a neural network of two things go in, two things go out. So we just made it a very, very simple version of it, right? And then that's really the, the key of what's going to be happening repeatedly here, right? I'm just going to basically going to say neural networks can do anything that uh, really big. It's kind of hard if they do that. But if you really make them do the simplest thing possible, they're able to do the simple thing really well. Right, and so using them as simple missing functions ends up being a way to be able to make them work on small data. The moment you try to make them do more, you're going to need more data. Right. Actually, in this example, if you don't add the fact that you already know these two different these two parts of different equation, then it won't extrapolate with the correct period. It'll get the periodicity wrong. So it really is, you know, we've added in just the right amount of information so that way it's able to do this correct. Right. So this really just shows that you know, like, and I kind of think that the way to boil this down is that there's a finite amount of information that you need to have in order to predict properly, right? And you either, you know, information can come from data or it can come from pre-known structure, prior structure that you know. You need to add up to the same amount of knowledge, it just doesn't matter how you get there, you just need to get there somehow, right? And the harder the problem is, the bigger that knowledge before it has to be, the more data or the more structure needs to be. Um, so yeah, so the next thing that we looked at was uh, this relationship to partial differential equations. So it turns out that convolutional neural networks and partial differential equations are actually very, very related. So if you look at the left here, this is the canonical convolutional operation. And what you do is you have a sliding window. So this one is 1, 0, 4, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, uh, 1. And what you do is you say, I'm going to, at this point, add this number plus this number plus this number plus this number plus this number, and I get the one over here. Right? And so you slide that window around, and that's how you go from this image to this convolved feature. Right? That's what a convolution operation is. Now, if you actually look at the mathematics of a, of a partial differential equation discretization, you know, so someone will write down that the finite difference method M on the Laplacian looks like this. Well, you can actually say that you know, this is, if you have the middle be x, y, this is 1 from the left plus 1, uh, one from the right, 
uh, plus one from the above, plus one from below, minus four in the middle, right? So in, in some, well, with delta x equal delta y, and that's simplification. Um, so basically, this, this, this thing right here is actually a convolution with respect to this stencil. So you just change the stencil weights, and now this, this discretization is the same thing. Where does this thing come from? Well, this is the discretization of the second derivative. And so if you ever saw a PDE like this, then you would expect that locally the way that it would act is like this convolutional neural network. And so if you, if you, could, you, get, if you actually train a neural network in the context of a scientific operation, you can actually look at that neural network and say, oh, the only thing that this thing could be describing is diffusion. And so we went and did that, and we said, here's some, we had some spatial temporal data that comes from the ground truth that we know, this picture takes the equations, and then we said, well, what if we say our, neural, our universal differential equation is we, we update vectors over time, right? So we, we define the CDE by there's a neural network part of it and a convolutional neural network part of it, right? And if we do that and we train that, then what we, then what we, well, we also add in one physical piece of information, right? So what do you know needs to be true about a partial differential equation uh, that doesn't need to be true about any possible convolutional neural network? Well, it turns out that you're always going to have that these tensile coefficients are adding to zero, right? Because that's the conservativity of these uh, PD operators, right? So we say, well, we add to our loss function that the that the train that after this training process, we have to have a conservative uh, PD operator. So that's actually something that's required in order for this to work. We added this physical information in, and you see that very quickly it learns that it needs to have a summation condition that the weight from the left plus the weight from the right plus the weight in the middle all had to equal zero. The other thing that it learned very quickly was that the weight from the left divided by the weight from the, uh, weight from the right had to be equal. And so that basically says that, well, the convolution operation is something where it's, you know, x, y, x, uh, x uh, minus 2x, x. And so the only thing that can give you that kind of behavior, if you're to look at it as a physical system, would have been a diffusion operator. And so you can directly look at the trained convolutional neural network here, and what it learns to be is a trained diffusion operator. And then what the reaction term learns to be is it learns to be a quadratic. And so just by saying I have spatial temporal data and I want to train it in this context by putting the convolutional neural network and a neural network here, you can then say, well, what did it learn? Well, you can look at the ways of the convolutional neural network and see the only thing that would have these kinds of central operations is a diffusion equation. And the only thing that would have, well, what does this look like? Well, it says, tells me what the semi-linear form of it is, and that means that the nonlinearity added to it was a quadratic. So by changing it into this form, we can then, then interpret back what the PDEs had to have been that would have generated this kind of uh, this kind of data, right? And how, how would you, yeah? How did you enforce the conservation law? Mm -hmm. Was it in the loss function? Yeah, so we put it in the loss function. We just said, oh, the sum of these things is part of the loss. You can also impose it structurally, though, right? You can basically say that weight number two is equal to weight number one plus weight number three, right? Or the opposite of them, right? And that actually makes it more stable. So in our, in our, in our things since this paper, we've actually been imposing more things structurally because it stabilizes a lot more. Um, but yeah, you, I, either way, you, you can do this, right? So you basically, and, and I will just note again that that had to be done in order for this to work, right? Um, the student came to me and was like, this thing isn't fitting. And I looked at it and said, well, the reason why it's not fitting is because the PD that you're trying to learn is not conservative, and you're going to infinity before the end of the equation. You can't bot propagate something that hits infinity. If we force it so that way this thing is going to be true, then we can keep on back propagating it and it stabilizes it in a way that they can then learn to be the PD. Right? And so by putting things into the context of PD and putting the right structure into our equations, then we learn something in a way that is then interpretable back to the PD. And we learned something that, you know, with just 30 data points or something in each point in space or each point in time, then we're able to learn this PDE quite easily because we've imposed the, the structure that needs to be there, right? By saying that it has to be convolutional neural network with a neural network, we're basically saying this is a semi-linear PDE. What semi-linear PDE generated the data, right? And so um, what, uh, some of the other things that we've been looking at are, for example, uh, stochastic differential equations. So if you have data, but you will not only have the mean, but also have the variances at each point, you can then say, well, I'm going to learn a stochastic differential equation that recapitulates the time series. And one of the interesting things that comes out of learning a stochastic dynamical system is you might know that some, some of these properties, like um, you know, dynamical systems might have a, 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 um, a tracking cycle, right? And so if you ever get far away from that cycle, you'll naturally keep on coming back to it. And so if you ever got too far away from this natural cycle, 
it will always keep on going back to the same spot. And so the variances of those, these predictions can't grow very fast, right? Because their, their trajectories, if they ever diverge too far, would keep on coming back. So this is a form of a way to be able to then learn something that will extrapolate in the future without making the variances diverge like a linear model would. And because it has the same properties of these dynamical systems that keep on pulling things back to these dynamical attractors. Right. And so embedding neural networks inside a scientific simulation can, you know, these are all examples of it being used to be able to find the dynamical system or be able to predict properties of it in the future. But the other interesting thing that we found is that we can use this to actually accelerate sim uh, scientific simulation itself, right? Which might be one of the things that a lot of people in the scientific uh, compu computing department might work on. Right, so one of these examples is uh, universal partial differential equations for um, accelerating climate parameterizations. So what's going on here? Well, inside of the climate, uh, inside of these climate models, right, a lot of what goes on is they're trying to simulate these Boston S equations. Right, it's a form of Navier Stokes. Um, but this, if you're actually trying to do this at a global scale in every single voxel, you would just never have a climate simulation that finishes. Right, so what they do is they say, well, if I take the, the average along x and y, then I can get an equation in just z, which is a diffusion injection equation. It turns out that that diffusion injection equation requires that you define a function in here. You don't know what that function is, and so you get a cascading set of infinitely many one-dimensional PDs, because there's no way to be able to describe a three-dimensional PD with convection in terms of one dimension, right? It's just impossible. But you can come up with a function approximation, so people did this by hand. But if you're catching on with what goes, what's been going on in this talk, here you have a function that you didn't know, and you have some climate data. And so you can say is, well, maybe a better thing to do than trying to come up with a linear quadratic approximation by hand is you just make this missing term of the PDE be a neural network, and you train the neural network in this context, and it will learn to be this parameterization. And we show that not only is this, is this possible, but if you do this, you know, you, you know, you might think that maybe using a neural network will slow things down, but you still get a 15,000 x acceleration over trying to solve the original equations by learning this approximation to it if you only cared about the solution along this one dimension, right? And so basically what, it, what this is saying is we already know a lot of things from science about how you know, certain equations are related. It's just sometimes the analysis the analyst can't prove what, what certain functions are, right? So you have these closure relations that have to be imposed. But these are perfect spots to actually just say, this is a nonlinear function that I didn't know, replace it with the neural network and just train that with the data that I have. And there you have a nonlinear closure relation, which is data driven, but still captures all the scientific structure that you had. And then we also show that, you know, that, that those, these, a lot of these examples have been on our PDs. You can also accelerate small differential equations. So we've, here we started with a, six, uh, a system of six uh, uh, differential algebraic equations that describe the movement of a non-Newtonian fluid. And what we did was we said, well, can we find and approximate the standard way this is done? Is you, you can get, a, a, you can get a, a cascading set of ODEs to approximate this DAE. And then you can say, well, what are the linear, what are the linear parameters that go here such that I have a good approximation? But any linear approximation, anything that you had an approximation before, you can say, well, maybe the better approximation is I replace parts of this with neural networks. And so what we find is we found two ODEs that approximates a system of six DAEs and gives you pretty much the same solution, except uh, it's able to solve the equations about two times faster. Right? And since it's still in a form that has all the physics in there, we can still change the physical parameters and see what happens to the fluid in different situations because we still are, are evolving the dynamics, we're just evolving a nonlinear closure form of these same dynamics, right? And so big systems, small systems, all these kinds of things can be accelerated by using differential equations embedded within their, uh, the solutions. And so one of the other things that we found is that you can wrap neural networks around physical simulators themselves. So here's a fun example, right? So um, I, I love the lock of water equations, so you can tell. So going back to them again. Uh, so there's four parameters in here, right? Alpha, beta, delta, gamma. And uh, given two of these parameters, could you tell me two, uh, the other two parameters such that the solution always will stay between zero and six? In some sense, that's a bifurcation problem, right? It's, it's a really weird bifurcation problem and be really hard to analytically find where, the, where you need to go. But what we can do is we can say, well, if we have four parameters, we can train a neural network, to be able, we can solve the differential equation and say yes or no whether this happens, right? And so what we could do is you could build a neural network that takes in two parameters and spits out the other two parameters such that it probably would be between zero and six. 
And then our loss function here is really, did it actually do the right thing, right? Did it, did it give me two parameters such that this set of four parameters will be below, will be below the line that we wanted? And you train this neural network, well, you know, you can get this thing to work well. Why do you think that you can get this to work well? Well, because we have infinite data, right? Because any, it, our data set is generated by using two parameters and two parameters, that's four parameters, go into the ODEs, get a new solution. So if we're ever wrong, we just train the neural network on the points that were wrong. We just keep on adding to our data set to do well. And so actually we start out, we go, eh, we got something incorrect. And we just keep on adding to our data set until we tend to get 100% efficiency or 100% accuracy, right? But what is this actually doing? This is pre-training something to be a control solution to original simulator, right? Where you can basically just say, there's some property that I wanted true out of my simulator. What parameters do I get used on the simulator? And this neural network can now be able to give you uh, the parameters that will cause that to be true without running the simulator, right? Because it's just, as long as you've done enough pre-training, right, there, there's still compute time that needs to be done. So you need to do a lot of compute to pre-compute to be able to train this neural network. But once it's trained, you no longer need to run your simulator to be able to solve this problem, right? If someone wants to, um, if someone wants to know the other two parameters that they need to change in order to cause the ecological system to be in this spot, well, here's a neural network that will instantly give you a response. Let's say you've now had a very, uh, a very uh, big uh, simulation for how your drone works, right? So you had all these Navier-Stokes equations and everything worked out. A simulator for high, very high fidelity can probably take 15 hours to run. So you can't have that be running on your drone to tell it, hey, you know, you had a small gust of wind, how should you control the solution? But what you can do is you can do the same thing where you say, well, what I want out of my simulation is this thing. And so therefore tell me what parameters I need to change for the rotary such that I go in this direction. And then you can, you can do all this pre-compute and train the neural network. And now you basically have trained a neural network to know enough about your simulation to cause the control in real time because you've done a, because you basically use this neural network to pre-compute and uh, pre-train how it should be acting. And so we've shown, for example, in the Greer Meinhardt equation, so it's a large partial differential equation, one of these Turing pattern systems where if you give it a set of parameters, it might form spots or it might not. And so we've shown that you know you, know, you can give it so you can train a neural network that takes in three parameters, spits out the other three parameters such that it will form spots. And this thing that, that does this prediction runs in you know uh, microseconds, and you know it runs it's because it's just doing a, a, it's just doing the forward pass of the neural network. How long did it take to train this thing? Well, we had to solve the partial differential equation you know thousands and thousands of times. But once you've done that once, now we've turned a problem that it would be really hard to actually work on in real time. We've taken a simulator that doesn't work in real time, and now built a real time control out of that simulator by putting a, by wrapping this neural network around it. Right, so we're using now a neural network in a very different context, but using its functional approximator abilities to be able to basically change the, change when we're doing compute, so that way now we're able to do something in real time where the simulator was too slow to do before. And so scientific machine learning really requires efficient solutions to these universal differential equations. Right, because basically everything I'm saying here is, oh yeah, yeah, you just train the differential equation here, or you train the neural network, define, you know, you train a convolutional neural network that's just embedded inside of a uh, inside of a, a PDE, right? No big, no big deal, right? Um, but really, what, what came what came down to mathematically was we need to be able to train these things, and so the packages to do this all exist within the Julian language because we built them to do this, right? Um, and so you'll find that there's this diffyqflux.jl, which is really uh, which is really what we built on to do the scientific machine learning in Julia. And it allows you to do universal ODEs, universal SDEs. We're releasing next month is it can also do stochastic delay differential equations. It does differential algebraic equations. So for example, if you want to impose that your solution has to have constant energy or live on a certain manifold, uh, certain constraint equations, you can impose those through a delay dif or a differential algebraic equation. Um, it also does a delay differential equation, so you can use delayed information inside of the differential equation. It handles stiffness, which is actually a very, very difficult topic to do in this. Um, uh, it handles hybrid equations for if you have events, like for example, when the ball hits the ground, you should have a discontinuous change in your velocity to go from downwards to upwards. Right? These kind of discontinuities have to be handled. And then all these have adjoints for being able to train neural networks embedded within the differential equations. So you basically can take any kind of these simu physical simulations, you know, these climate models or you know these, these ecological models, you stick neural networks in them and you learn and you train them in the given context. 
And um, and for people in the room, since this is scientific computing, people, you know, someone's always going to be like, "Can you do this really crazy algorithm that's required for my problem?" The answer is pretty much yes. So uh, here's an example that is you know, neural ODE with batching on the GPU without extra data transfers, um, with high order adaptive implicit ODE solvers for SIP equations using a matrix-free Newton Prilog with preconditioned cameras and checkpoint and adjoint. So like all the different buzzwords that you hear that are required for these gigantic partial differential equations, yes, they're all in there because that's what we use to be able to make these examples with, right? Um, but I think that the more interesting thing than, you know, there's this package out there, go use it if you want, or just go poo poo on it if you don't want to, right? Uh, I think the more interesting thing is how do we build this thing in a time that is, in a time frame that is actually reasonable, right? Because building, if you want to implement each, each of these pieces, like takes like a year. And so if you wanted to then go, or if you then wanted to then say, oh, I want to do this in TensorFlow, right? Tensor, you'd have to go re-implement every little detail in TensorFlow. So how do you get here without actually having to re-implement everything for your neural network library for each new neural network library that comes up, right? And so oh, oh, I forgot that, yeah. So we also have things like automatic sparsity detection so we can analyze your code, find out what the sparsity pattern is, and then uh, specialize the Jacobian calculations on it with all, all sorts of extra, extra things. So if we want one tutorial to look at, we have an advanced ODE solving tutorial which says, here's how we can look at your problem, automatically change it to symbolic form, calculate symbolic, you know, all these kind of fun things. So how did this thing get made, right? And really the, the way that we made this tool was to not try to write code to do it because that'd be really way too hard, right? We wrote code that wrote code to do it. And so this is what we really want to describe here is, why do, why do we do this all in Julia? And what is this science of code generation? This is another takeaway point kind of that um, what, what we'll be describing here is, is, you know, what we'll be describing here, this code generation tool is actually something that you can use much more generally across scientific disciplines. And we haven't really seen it done very much in scientific computing. So I'm curious to see if more people come up with new ways to do this. So what is the Julia programming language? So most people know it as, you know, the fast version of Python Matlab. And that's one reason why people adopt it, but that's not the reason why we're using it here. That's not the interesting part. So the interesting thing is that Julia works in a way such that every single function is a generic algorithm. And then when it sees new types, it will JIT compile based off of the types that it sees. And that is something that we can hijack to be able to do new mathematics on. What do I mean by that? Well, let's start with differential equations idea. So it's a gigantic differential equation solver library with GPU compatibility, uh, IMAX methods, adaptive methods for high order stochastic differential equations, all sorts of random things that you won't find other places. So we had this library to start with. And we said, we want to do neural networks inside of it. So instead of rewriting it, how do we do cogeneration on this? Um, Oh, I guess I moved, I moved some slides around. So another thing is that this differential equation solver library can, uh, can not only does it handle a whole bunch of things like you know PDEs and Gillespie simulation, but also if your model is something like I have a protein X, which you know I, I model with an array the amount of protein with X, and then I have cells split apart, so I change the number of differential equations. You can do in 30 lines of code differential equations which are changing the size. And here, uh, here on the y-axis, this is the size of differential equation. So you can have all these crazy models where you don't have anything crossing, you're changing the size of your equations. This thing is able to do a whole lot of things. We can't rewrite this in TensorFlow. How do we make a neural network work in here? How can we make it so that we can say, this, this part of my program should be a learnable function, stick a neural network there and learn it, right? Because that's essentially what we did to make uh, universal differential equations work. So the notion of yeah. backpropagation or training used in a more general fashion yeah, so does not imply differentiability within your system. Yeah, it doesn't imply differentiability. Okay. Yeah, um, because you can have discontinuities in right. your solution, but yet there, I mean, it, we, we could discuss more about exactly what's going on in that mm -hmm. case, but yeah. Um, so what we really want to do is we want to use code generation to build a backpropagation through any possible program, not just things that are neural networks. So what does that look like? So what we want to do is we want to have a generic algorithm, A of x, y, given t, where if we, if we, once we know the, the, uh, the type t, we can generate a program, right? So this might seem abstract, but you actually do this in your head all the time, right? So for example, 2x, uh, 2x plus y squared is not a meaningful mathematical expression, right? It looks like one, but it means something different on the integers than it means from the rational numbers, than it means from the uh, real numbers. It means something completely different on quaternions, right? But you still understand in all those different contexts 
what this mathematical function is, right? So in some sense, you have the generic form of the mathematical algorithm, and then you have the form of that mathematical algorithm in its concrete type system, right? In its concrete, I, once you know the, the, the types of all your elements, then it actually has a well-defined operation. And so what Julie is actually doing, uh, it is working mathematically just like that. So when I write down f of x, y equals 2x plus y squared, it actually is keeping a generic form of my algorithm it, that isn't actually computable. And the moment I say f is equal to, a, you know, the x is equal to uh, a float 32 and y is equal to a float 32, what it does, is, so here I'm saying code LLVM, show me the generated LLVM code, the, basically the LLVM assembly. You look at this assembly, it builds you an assembly which is built off of, I know they have two 32-bit floating point numbers in, and it does exactly just the floating float 32 operation. Okay. When you put float 64s in there, then it's generating code specifically for float 64s. So this is the key to Julia, this multiple dispatch, and this is why it's actually fast, right? It's doing this, it's doing this uh, propagation of what the types are. So it's saying, if my types are these, then my types are the next step are these. And then it's, uh, behind the scenes, it's building a statically typed code. But what I'm gonna say next is that you don't have to do this. To, this is not just a tool for making uh, code fast, but it's also a tool that you can use to do mathematics on itself. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at automatic differentiation. So numerical differentiation, we know numerical differentiation is bad, right? So how do we do better than numerical differentiation? Well, if you do a Taylor series of, uh, uh, so let's say f is a real function, x is a real value, and then we put in to our real function this complex number, x plus ih, divided by h, and then take the imaginary part, it can show by a quick Taylor series expansion that this thing is an approximation to the first derivative that doesn't have the same uh, issues as um, numerical differentiation. And the reason is because you never have your small values touch the big values because they're actually kept in different dimensions, right? Because this, this, this is 64 bits, this thing is stored in the computer as 64 bits and 64 bits, and they don't ever merge together, right? And so, um, and, and so basically what you can do is you can say, well, maybe if I just change my arithmetic, I can calculate derivatives at the same time that I'm using the forward pass of my program. And so if you, you can develop this thing called a dual number where x equals a plus b epsilon, where epsilon squared equals zero. So this is a form of, of infinitesimals known as smooth infinitesimal arithmetic. Um, you can actually make this analytically uh, correct. I can discuss this in more detail. So you define this thing and you say, well, here's how I want a dual number to work. Essentially, this right here is the chain rule. So if you allow these two rules to be correct, what happens with your arithmetic system? Well, it turns out that if you add two dual numbers, then you get x plus y, and you get x prime plus y prime. So hey, you know this is if x was the real value, was the value, y was the value, x was your previous derivative, y was your previous derivative. This would be the pro, you know this is the derivative of the sum of the thing. And what do you get when you take the product? Well, you get the you get the product out, and you get the product rule for the derivative. So it turns out that if you do this type of, if instead of doing your original arithmetic, if you change to this arithmetic, then not only do you compile a program that calculates your solution, but you calculate a simultaneous part of your program, or you compile a simultaneous part of your program that also com uh, computes the derivative, right? And this is this uh, idea of differentiable programming where now if anything that was doing a reg your original arithmetic, if you just allow yourself to recompile your arithmetic to do this thing instead, now you're suddenly doing, uh, now you suddenly have built a program that does the same thing as your original program that simultaneously calculates the derivative of the output. Right. And how do you do this in Julia? Well, since every single algorithm in Julia is just duct type to be a generic algorithm, you can take any arbitrary package that is written in pure Julia code, you can stick a number type that does this thing in it, it will recompile all the steps to do this arithmetic, and now it will be something that calculates both its original value and the derivative of the values with respect to the parameters, right? And so it's just a code generation tool that gives you all these differentiation tools. It's a, yeah. It's a, fancy, it's a fancy form of operator overloading. Yeah, it's a fancy form of operator overloading, exactly. And it's operator overloading that's done in compile time and then lots of nice things, right? And so the, the so basically what happens is that, you know, if you just define new arithmetic, so you can get all these kinds of backpropagation out. You can also define other types of adjoints. I won't go into detail on all the adjoints, but this is really the core of, of something that's interesting that you can then see how you can use just to, you know, if you can go to an algebraic and ask them, like, what are some cool algebras that you know? And suddenly cool new algebras might give you something cool in a program just by recompiling it. 
And so what I wanted, you know, so what I want to end here is, you know, we mentioned a bunch of things with uh, with neural networks, but what are some other ways that you can use this code generation tool, this code generation idea, to be able to solve mathematical problems? So here's one. Um, here's one that was invented by itself, right? So someone, it, it, so here, I, because people sometimes ask, like, did it really invent itself? I like to put the, you know, someone on the Julia discourse, right, this community where we talk about, you know, different, using different packages. So what someone did was they created this measurement.dl, which is a package for number types that have uncertainty propagation. They put that number type into differential equations.jl. And suddenly, differential equations at JL became a differential equation solver with uncertainty propagation. So how does this thing work? Well, what it does is it defines your arithmetic in such a way such that if your original value was a normal distribution, then the, you know you apply f to this normal distribution. What is the approximate normal distribution that would come out? And you do a quick Taylor series expansion and be able to show what would your mean be and what would your uh, variance be. And so on these all these uh, primitive functions, you can just say, oh, you know, the sign of a normal distribution will have with this mean and variance, we'll have this mean and variance. And now you just say, you know, I'm going to recompile my whole program automatically to do this arithmetic because the value that you put in was a measurement value. So then every single step of the program will do this, and then the output will be something with error bars, even though it didn't have to do any sampling or anything. Does it actually work? Well, yeah, so that I can work. <laughs> and, you know, so th this is what it looks like. Right? So without, without any change to the packages, um, you say my parameters are gravitational constant with some uncertainty, length of the pendulum with some uncertainty. You define the OEE, right? This is no different than the no normal usage of differential equations at scale. It's a theory with some plus and minuses. And then you solve the differential equation. Right, and we'll, what it will have done is it will have recompiled your the, the, the differential equation solver, such as doing this uncertainty propagation every single step, mm -hmm. and if you compare it to the analytical solution of the of the differential equation, you see that not only does, does the numerical solution line up, but also the error bars line up right on top of that that equation. So basically, this is you know this, there's no sampling going on, no Bayesian thing going on. This is hey, this, here's a good arithmetic for doing uncertainty propagation. And now that we've recompiled our entire code to be able to do this operation, now it's just doing uh, uncertainty propagation through something that's a very nonlinear operation. And so another one that might fit better into scientific computing land is you know you, you probably talk to all your grad students all the time like oh the right way to do partial differential equations is with Sobolev spaces right what is a Sobolev space well it's a function space for representing functions you know it's a fun it's a way to represent functions in a function space as the you know these L2 functions are now just kind of a form of a scalar right. You basically just say, well, if I had an expansion, you can think about f in L2 as an infinite length vector, right, with just the Fourier coefficients, right? And there are many different ways to be able to parameterize these, these uh, function spaces. But really what you do with this is you say, well, now I can represent functions inside of the Bonnet space, right? There's an algebra on these Bonnet spaces, right? Because, you know, f plus g is, the function, is also a function in the space. Um, f times g, right? You just have to work out how you would change around these vectors to give you the, the mathematical operation. But you can just basically say, well, you know, if I have a representation of a function, I can define an algebra that gives me, you know, multiply two functions. What is the sign of this original function? And once you've worked out that algebra, now you have a scalar that represents a function. And so, you know, if you remember your semigroup theory, well, semigroup theory says that uh, ODEs defined by Bonnach spaces, which are given by functions, um, this is another way, uh, an ODE of functions as your scalars is another way to represent a PD. Yeah. So can we, do th can we use this to be able to build a PDE solver on its own, right? Can we just take an existing ODE solver and recompile it to solve a PDE? And it turns out you can. So Proxone defines this function type, this fun, where what it does is it represents a, a, it represents a, um, an arbitrary function by its, you know, by its coefficients in some discretization space. So it's a lot like Chef Fun, right? If you know about check fun. And what you do is you say, well, this now what I can do is for the ODE solver is I let one of these scalars functions uh, be the initial condition to my ODE. I define the ODE for the PDE, right, uh, for how it evolves. And once I do that, you know, then you just stick it in there. And then ta-da, now it's solving PDEs because now it's solving PDEs, uh, but because those are the same thing as ODEs where your scalars are functions, right? And so essentially all that we did was we used this compilation trick, the same thing as before. We define an arithmetic on a new space, and then by recompiling to that new space, now we get something that is probably the first uh, major we've used, you know, adaptive space plus adaptive time to the spectrum method. 
right? Because it's adapting in, in time because of the adaptive ODE solver. It's adapting in space because this, this function type was made to choose the number of coefficients it needed such that it would be able to hit a certain tolerance in the, in the function that's approximating. So every single step is adapting in different ways. We never really coordinated how it adapts. It's just, you know, you put the two together, it recompiles, and it does this thing. So composable software is really the tool that we might need to get like beyond handwritten software because there's no way that we, every single time someone comes out with a TensorFlow 2, you know, Swift for TensorFlow, we just say, hey, let me rewrite my entire climate simulator into Swift because you know, that's what Google said to use now. But that's not going to happen. But, once, but if we do things like this, you know, then we can say, well, the new climate simulator between MIT and Caltech is written in pure Julia. They've written this climate simulator already now. And so using these techniques, we can differentiate through it. That means we can put uh, neural networks in there, and that means we can do these scientific machine learning within the context of a full climate model. Now we have a way to be able to get, you know, using the full scientific structure with, in a way that is actually practically realizable. Right? So in, in some sense, you could you know, take every single Fortran solver that's me method that's ever been written and rewrite it to TensorFlow, maybe. Um, but using composable software checks and, co and code generation, like is afforded in the GUI programming language, can really bridge that gap really fast. And this is where we, how we've really done differential programming and made all these techniques work. And so where, we, where we're really at now, and this is this one slide that is on the MyPharmacometrics connection, is um, we actually have a startup that's, that started out of the University of Maryland, which is uh, using, um, using scientific, these scientific machine learning techniques to automatically utilize these, this healthcare data, we will train a, a, a DSS. So this is a decision support system of essentially how should you be uh, dosing patients differently when these kind of drugs are very dose dependent. So with some of the things that we're looking at are, for example, um, neonatal, um, uh, neonatal withdrawal syndromes. For example, if a mother has a opioid addiction, and the, then when the infant is born, the infant will also be born with an opioid addiction. And so you have to wean the, the infant off of opioids, but if you overdose them, then you will kill the infant. So this is actually a very major thing that's going on, especially in places like Baltimore. And it turns out that everyone's metabolism is different. And so this, this amount that you have to hit that is perfect for each individual is completely dependent, but a very small range. And so by using, by automatically learning the, how the pharmacometric equation should be different, depending on different individuals, by using their healthcare records, right, we can both keep the science that we know about pharmacokinetics while simultaneously utilizing the tools of deep, deep learning. And so we're actually putting this into practice. Um, big pharmaceuticals are now adopting this. This is a whole crazy exercise of the research. But this is showing that you know, um, scientific machine learning is really going, it's at the spot now where it's making bridges into industry and, and trying to solve some real problems. And so what I want to leave with is that machine learning can greatly be improved, right? And what are ways, some ways to improve it? Well, in that, at least in the context of science, we can use the scientific knowledge that we have, and we can use all the knowledge that we have in numerical analysis. So what I showed was uh, machine learning with scientific knowledge is these neural networks inside a differential equation, like these universal differential equations with these nice properties of being able to essentially impose all the structure that we know, but then use a neural network for the functions that we don't know and be able to use simultaneously the pros of, of the two approaches. And but how, how can we kind of get there? Well, the last kind of detail is that we might need to be working on composability of software because we need to be able to differentiate through very arbitrary codes in order to do this kind of scientific machine learning. And so where we're going to keep on going is making bigger and bigger simulators, you know, these pharmacometrics methods, these climate simulators, and showcasing how to be able to impose more scientific knowledge and learn more in these contexts. So for example, if you have an entire weather model that happens to be differentiable maybe in next month, then maybe you be, can do something like uh, change the way that we're doing these parameterizations and the things that we are non-physical parts, we can maybe make better non-linear approximations. And certain things like that, you can then say, I'm using all of the information I have to then improve my simulators with this deep learning embedded within a scientific simulation process. So thank you very much. Do you have any questions?